in Sooner, Air Depot, Midwest, Douglas, or Post Roads on I-240, and you're in your car, you need to get out of your car, you need to go park, you need to park your car underneath an underpass, get out of your car now, and go up underneath those girders, oh, and get up there, the and, and wedge yourself yeah. up in those is. girders. I don't know. Oklahoma, a state that has seen many tornadoes throughout history. One larger suburb of the OKC metro knows that all too well. More. I purposely used the same intro statement for my video about the 2013 Moore tornado, as the same thing happened 14 years prior, just with more intensity. As on May 3rd, 74 tornadoes would touch down in Oklahoma, killing more than 46 and leaving more than 800 injured. One of those 74 would be rated F5, as it would carve a 37-mile path through the OKC metro, attaining the highest winds ever recorded on Earth. In this video, we break down the meteorological setup, the tornado, the outbreak as a whole, and its aftermath. This is the story of May 3rd, 1999. 1999 had an extremely active January 4 tornadoes, with 213 touching down from a series of outbreaks. By the time May rolled around, 473 tornadoes had touched down, killing 34. In the first two days of May 1999, 19 tornadoes had touched down, causing no injuries or fatalities. But people had no concern for those two days. All eyes laid on the day in front, May 3rd, 1999. At least they should have been. Initially, the outbreak was really underestimated, and only a slight risk was initially issued for the affected areas. So let's look at the ingredients in place. On May 3rd, a dry line was stretching from western Kansas into western Texas that was approaching a warm, humid air mass over the central plains. The conditions ahead of the dry line and a connecting trough positioned over northeastern Colorado appeared to favor the development of thunderstorms later that day that would contain large hail, damaging straight light winds, and isolated tornadoes. Temperatures in the mid-80s were present across Oklahoma. Subsequent dew points were approaching the high 60s throughout most of the state, creating Cape values from 3,500 to 4,500 joules per kilogram across western to central Oklahoma. Winds at the 500 millibar were in excess of 65 knots, and lower at the 850 millibar, winds were approaching 60 knots. All these factors are what fueled the historic outbreak. In the early a.m. hours of the 3rd, the SPC meteorologists began to recalculate model data during the morning to account for the stronger wind profiles caused by the jet stream. The data acknowledged that thunderstorms would occur within the central plains, but disagreed on the exact area of greatest severe weather risk. By 7 a.m. central daylight time, despite conflicting model data on the specified area where thunderstorms would develop, the newly available information of Cape values in that part of the state prompted the SBC to upgrade the forecasted threat of severe weather from a slight risk to a moderate risk for south central Kansas. Much of the western two-thirds of Oklahoma and the northwestern and north-central portions of Texas. By the early afternoon hours, forecasters at both the SPC and NWS Norman realized that a major event was likely to take place. Based solely on observational data from radar and weather satellite imagery and balloon soundings, as the commuter models remained uncooperative in helping the meteorologists determine where the greatest threat of severe weather would occur. As the conditions became worse and worse, many channels suspended normal programming and began their weather coverage, two of which were K4, home to Mike Morgan, and KWTV Channel 9, home to Gary Englund. By 4.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the SPC issued a tornado watch for western central Oklahoma, effective until 4.45 p.m., until 10 p.m. Central Daylight Time that evening. For the threat of tornadoes, hail up to 3 inches in diameter, wind gusts up to 80 miles an hour, and intense lightning. As that happened, the first thunderstorm cell of the unfolding event had already formed over southwestern Oklahoma. The storm that would produce the record-breaking tornado began around 3.20 p.m. Central Daylight Time over northeastern Tillman County. Despite the lack of overall lift present in the region, the storm formed located well ahead of the dry line that was still positioned farther to the west, which provided enhanced lift and speed shear necessary to develop the supercell. Tracking northeast, the storm strengthened and entered Comanche County shortly after 4 p.m. Central Daylight Time. By 4.15 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the NWS Norman office issued a severe thunderstorm warning for Comanche County. 
as the initial storm continued to rapidly intensify over the southern half of the county. There, hail up to 1.75 inches began to fall. As the supercell's mesocyclonic rotation began to rapidly strengthen at the cloud base, a tornado warning was issued for the counties of Comanche, Caddo, and Grady at 4.50 p.m. Central Daylight Time. One minute later, a small tornado less than 75 feet in diameter touched down, the first of 14 associated with this lone supercell. Five more tornadoes developed as the storm continued northeast. A sixth one would be given an F3 rating, as it touched down a short time later and caused substantial damage in central Grady County, including some to the Chickasha Municipal Airport, where roofs have torn off two hangars. At 6.23 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the ninth tornado from the supercell touched down two miles south of Amber. The tornado this day is known for has just started its reign of terror. The tornado quickly intensified in both strength and size as it crossed Oklahoma State Highway 92, attaining F4 strength about four miles east-northeast of Amber. As it very quickly widened, it became a wedge tornado as it entered Bridge Creek, just as it hit F5 intensity. As the tornado moves through Bridge Creek, Josh Worman and his Vortex team are blasting toward the tornado in their Doppler on wheels, or commonly referred to as the DOW. Very good dual Doppler on this right now. After two hours driving, they're starting to close in on their target. Look at the tornado. Man, that was visual. Man, that looks nice. I guess that's crossing the road now. Tracking the tornado for an hour and a half, they can calculate where it's heading next. They're closing in on the tornado, and as they are receiving data from inside the funnel, they are shocked at what is displayed on their computers. The tornado is possessing winds over 300 miles per hour, the fastest winds ever on Earth. The damage that would be unleashed inside Bridge Creek by those speeds was devastating. Many homes were swept away completely, leaving only concrete slabs where the structures once stood. Damaged surveyors noted that the remaining structural debris from some of the homes in this area was granulated into small fragments, and uh, trees and shrubs were completely debarked. Few of these homes were bolted to their foundations. Approximately 200 homes and mobile homes were destroyed, and hundreds of other structures were damaged. The Ridgecast Baptist Church in Bridge Creek was also destroyed in the process. Extensive ground scouring occurred, and vehicles were thrown hundreds of yards where they originated, including a mangled pickup truck that was found wrapped around a telephone pole. About one inch of asphalt would be scoured off one road, and 12 people would lose their life in Bridge Creek nine of whom were in mobile homes. All fatalities and most injuries were concentrated in the Willow Lake and Southern Hills additions and Breeds Creek estates, consisting of mostly mobile homes. Over 39 people were injured in this area as well. As the tornado continued past Bridge Creek, it maintained its northeast trajectory as it weakened to an F4. After a short period at F4 status, the tornado re-intensified back to F5 throwing a car a quarter mile into the air and slabbing several homes. After crossing the Canadian River, the tornado widened to its maximum size and began becoming rain-wrapped. Jim Gardner, then helicopter pilot for K4TV, reported during the station's live coverage of the storm that the tornado was at least one mile wide and was embedded, or rain-wrapped, in the precipitation core associated with the main circulation, making it difficult to see. As it was becoming clear that a particularly violent tornado was moving into some of the most densely populated areas of central Oklahoma, around 6.57 p.m. Central Daylight Time, NWS Norman issued the first ever tornado emergency for southern portions of Oklahoma City metropolitan area. David Andra, a meteorologist at the NWS Norman office, said that in drafting the enhanced warning, he wanted to, quote, paint the pictures to residents in the areas that would be affected by the storm, that a rare and deadly tornado was imminent in the metro area. Two minutes later, at 6.59 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the SPC issued a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch for much of the central third of Oklahoma, effective from 7.15 p.m. until midnight. As they knew, much more was soon to come. Paralleling Interstate 44, the tornado moved into McLean County, where it crossed the highway twice at F4 intensity, killing a woman who was blown up from an underpass where she was attempting to seek shelter, after being dragged down the embankment by the tornado and its intense channeling winds. 
Her 11-year-old son, with whom the woman vacated their stalled car nearby, survived, staying held tight onto the steel girders of the overpass. A man who had helped the mother and son up the overpass suffered severe injuries. He was clinging to the overpass when his skin began flapping and smashing into the concrete. Seconds later, a street sign flew in at a blistering speed, impacting his leg, slicing it to the bone. The 11-year-old boy who survived carved his name in the mud that was slung up to the overpass. Other figures can be seen outlined by the mud. These figures are often referred to as the ghosts of Moore. At 7.10 p.m. Central Daylight Time, a satellite tornado touched down over an open field north of Newcastle. It was rated F-0 due to lack of damage. In McLean County, 38 homes and two businesses were destroyed, and 40 homes, some of which were leveled at F-4 intensity, were flattened. 17 people were injured. The tornado entered Cleveland County and weakened to an F-2 intensity. By this time, it had entered the south side of Oklahoma City. Several minutes after entering the county, it reattained F-4 status, and then moved directly into the city of Moore, reaching F-5 intensity for a third time. Some of the most severe damage took place in Cleveland County, mainly in Moore, where 11 people were killed, 293 others were injured. The tornado caused an estimated $450 million in damages across this county alone. The first area impacted more was a county place estate subdivision, where 50 homes were destroyed, and one was swept queenly from its foundation at F5 intensity. Several vehicles were picked up and tossed nearly a quarter mile away from their previous location. According to police, an airplane wing, believed to have been from an airport in Grady County, possibly lofted into the storm's updraft from when the Supercell 6 tornado hit Chickasha Municipal Airport, was found near County Place Estates. The powerful tornado struck the densely populated Greenbrier East Lake Estates at F5 intensity, killing three people and reducing entire rows of homes to rubble. In one instance, four adjacent homes were destroyed, with only concrete slabs standing, warranting an F5 rating at that location. Three other homes in the Houdensing Division also received F5 damage, with the remaining destruction rated high-end F4. Severe debarking of trees was noted in this area, and at the Emerald Springs Apartments, three more people were killed, and a two-story apartment building was mostly flattened. Flights were grounded at Will Rogers Airport, as a concern of a northern shift in the tornado's path was feared. The northern edge of the supercell, containing hail up to 1.25 inches, straight-line wind gusts up to 75 miles per hour, and moderate to heavy rain approached the area, further giving reason to freeze all flights. This was not the only area of concern, as the NWS office in Norman was evacuated, leaving the warnings up to NWS Tulsa. As the tornado banked to the right, just outside of East Lake Estates, an honor ceremony was being held at Westmore High School at the time of the tornado. Adequate warning time allowed those at the school to seek shelter. However, more than 400 adults and students attending the awards ceremony at the school's auditorium were moved to the main building, sheltering in the reinforced hallways and bathrooms. Ultimately, Westmore High School sustained heavy damage, and dozens of cars that were in the school's parking lot were tossed around, some of which were destroyed or thrown into nearby homes. No injuries took place at the school, though a horse was found dead between a couple of destroyed cars in the area. The tornado proceeded through additionally densely populated areas of Moore shortly thereafter, where several large groups of homes were flattened in residential areas with a mixture of high-end F4 and low-end F5 damage being noted in the survey. Near Janeway Avenue, four people were killed in an area where multiple homes were destroyed. A woman who took shelter with her husband and two children was also killed when she was blown out from under the Shields overpass on Interstate 35. Several others under the overpass suffered horrifying injuries, as some had missing fingers, ears, and noses. The tornado entered Oklahoma County and struck the southeast fringes of Oklahoma City, where it re-intensified to a high-end F4 strength. Two people were killed in this area as a building, housing, and truck company was destroyed. Shortly before it tracked into the county, patrons and employees at the Crossroads Mall were evacuated to storage areas in the basement of the building. Numerous industrial buildings were leveled in this area of the city. A freight railroad car weighing 36,000 pounds was thrown three-quarters of a mile. 
The car bounced as it traveled, remaining airborne f- for 50 to 100 yards at a time. Multiple homes were also destroyed in the southeast Oklahoma City, and one woman was killed in that area. Crossing southeast 44th Street into Dell City, the tornado moved through the highly populated Dell Air Housing Edition, killing six people and damaging or destroying hundreds of homes, with many sustaining F3 to F4 damage. Seven people were killed as a direct result of the tornado in Dell City, and hundreds of homes were damaged or destroyed. The tornado then crossed Sooner Road and subsequently damaged an entry gate and several buildings at Tinker Air Force Base, then crossed 29th Street into Midwest City, destroying one building at the Boeing Complex and damaging two others. Widespread F3 to F4 damage continued as the tornado moved across Interstate 40, affecting a large business district. Approximately 800 vehicles at the Hootie Berg Auto Group were damaged, located just south of Interstate 40. Hundreds of vehicles at the dealership were moved from their original locations on the lot, and dozens of vehicles, including 30 awaiting tune-ups or repairs at Morris's Auto Machine and Supply, and an un- unoccupied Middell School District bus were picked up and tossed northward across the interstate into several motels, being carried approximately two-tenths of a mile. Numerous motels and other businesses, including Hampton Inn, Comfort Inn, Inn Suites, Clarion Inn, Cracker Barrel, and portions of Rose State College were destroyed. While some of the damage in this area was rated high and F4, low end F5 was considered. The tornado then continued into another residential area located between Southeast 15th and Reno Avenue, where three fatalities occurred. Damage consistent with high end F4 wind speeds was inflicted to four homes in this area. Two of these homes were located between Southeast 11th and 12th Streets, near Buena Vista, and the other two homes were located on Will Rogers Road, just south of Southeast 15th. Damage then diminished rapidly down to an F0 to F1 strength as the tornado crossed Reno Avenue, before dissipating three blocks north of Reno, between Sooner Road and Air Depot Boulevard, leaving 36 dead along its 37 miles of destruction over its one hour and 25 minute life. With that, this tornado was over, but the outbreak was certainly not. An F4 would strike Dover, killing one. Another F4 would strike Mulhall, killing two. The next day on the 4th, an F4 would kill six as it hit Wichita, Kansas, and many other F1 to F3 tornadoes would injure many more. Several tornadoes touched down into the 4th and the 5th, but besides the Wichita Falls F4, all others led to nothing of significance. 36 people were killed as a direct result of the storm, and five more died of indirect causes in the hours following it. Most of the indirect deaths were due to heart attacks or injuries suffered while trying to seek shelter. One survivor was uninjured but died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound in an apparent reaction to losing his home in the tornado. A total of 8,132 homes, 1,041 apartments, 260 businesses, 11 public buildings, and 7 churches were damaged or destroyed. Estimated damage totals costed around $1.2 billion, making it the first recorded tornado to exceed $1 billion in estimated damages. President Bill Clinton later came to the affected areas and signed a major declaration for disaster for 11 Oklahoma counties, including the four that were affected by the Bridge Creek Moor tornado. Many fatalities or life-threatening injuries occurred from people sheltering under overpasses. In the 90s, No one really knew how bad it was. The event people point to that started the myth was in 1991, when a Kansas film crew survived a tornado by sheltering under an overpass. The video was shown across America, and seeing it, many thought overpasses were a good option when on the road. And you're in your car, you need to get out of your car, you need to go park, you need to park your car underneath an underpass, get out of your car now, and go up underneath those girders. The winds recorded by the Moore tornado were the fastest on Earth, however. Since the record from maximum wind speeds are reported from only non-tornadic events, the 253-mile-per-hour wind gusts from Cyclone Olivia in 1996 retained the title of fastest winds. To conclude, the events of May 3rd were unfortunate. Catastrophic damage and suffering was unleashed upon the state of Oklahoma. The main thing to be learned was that overpasses were a terrible place to seek shelter and that is all if you enjoyed please like and subscribe as this video is a nightmare to script right and edit 
So if you could reward me, I'd appreciate it. If you want to keep up to date with my videos or chat with me, then I suggest joining my Discord in the pinned comment and the description. And, um, yeah, see ya.